This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Good evening and welcome to the John Cotton Memorial Lecture. The Institute of Advanced Study um, organises each year John Coffin Memorial Lectures on behalf of the university. The lectures were a gift from John Coffin's son, Arthur Charles Coffin, in honour of his father. John Coffin was a journeyman blacksmith from Dorset, and on the 30th of March, 1868, his wife had a son, called Charles Arthur Coffin, and she made her mark on the birth certificate because she was unable to read or write. At that point, John Coffin might have expected that he would have a fairly traditional life in the Dorset community, but instead, through education, he rose to become a student of the University of London, He took his degree at the University of London in Arts in 1889, and he took it by private study with the help of tuition at Battersea College. On leaving the university, John Coffin went into the study of education and rose to become the inspector of schools for Bradford. When he died, he left to the university in 1956, all of his estate, with the idea that there should be lectures dedicated to broadening education and dedicated to making the subjects of history, literature, science, and Christian ethics available to a wider public. It was very important to him that at a time at which he said people were becoming very specialized in their subjects, there should be an attempt to talk to a wider public and make available the knowledge that uh, he had so much valued. The Coffin Trust also states that at each of these events, and this is the lecture on science, that it be announced that this is the John Coffin Memorial. And that is why we think that the request is obviously in honour of his father. It's very fitting, given the inspiring nature of John Coffin's story, that we should have a very inspiring lecturer tonight on science, and that is uh, Colin Blakemore, known to many of you. Colin is the Professor of Neuroscience at Oxford and at Warwick University, Fellow of the Royal Society, previously head of the MRC. And for those of you like me, uh, old enough to remember our early inspiration as young students, Reef Lectures by Colin and Royal Institution Christmas Lectures by Colin, and his youthful appearance belies the fact that they were so many years ago um, in Bibel State. There are many, many honours, and I won't uh, attempt to read them out, but instead um, we should say that Colin has always been a passionate campaigner and an advocate for the advancement of science. And here, with the lecture happening both as part of the University of London and also in association with the Centre for the Study of the Senses, where we try to bring together philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists to make common cause in understanding some of the nature of our perceptual experience It's entirely fitting and appropriate, and we're delighted to have Colin, who's an expert on vision, coming to talk to us tonight with an intriguing title, Vision Impossible. Colin, welcome. Thank you. I would like to have some insight into whether I can edit the PowerPoint presentation I'm just going to give while waiting to give it. Um, It keeps it. Interesting. For those of you who are better at the PowerPoint than me, tell me why a, a video that I'm putting into it's got, I think it's going to be all right now, a video that I'm putting into a, um, a frame turns itself into a static JPEG image. More worrying is that it's well, not, it's not copying. No, that's, good. That's, that's, that's simple. That's a mechanical thing. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. It might not work when I come to the crucial picture. There we go. just see what I'm talking about. Might work. Right. 
can go. Right, thank you very much for the um, kind introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about vision, which I spent a lot of my time, my life working on, and and, re and uh, admit that the, the whole question of how we see the world still remains extremely problematical to me. Um, and I'll try and get to the reasons for that gradually, progressively, through a, through a sequence of, of arguments, or perhaps I should say a, a list. You were talking earlier about the way in which scientists tend to produce slides with lots of bullet points and statements, and philosophers presume that those must be the steps in some kind of logical argument, I'm terribly worried when they're just lists. So I'll just give you a list of things and issues to think about. Um, okay, you've been looking at this image for a while, very familiar image. Anything unusual about it? Does anyone spot anything unusual about it? Don't actually say it, just put up your hands if you've seen anything straight yet. Well, you know, 98% of you don't see anything too. Um, this is not God. Uh, this is Charles Darwin. <laughs> I mean, you know, it might be appropriate, but it's certainly not the original Michelangelo. Um, so, that's interesting. There's an image which you're incredibly familiar with. You've seen time and again. You know all the symbolism, the, the iconography, and everything of that uh, image. Many of you will have seen it in, in the flesh, as it were. And yet, when confronted with it, you don't immediately recognize that something all about it. So, what actually did you see, and what did you remember about what you saw, that wasn't a good enough simulation of the original experience in your head to allow you to tell, allow your brain to know that something very wrong with the image you just saw. Um, well, let's start with the biological um, argument, and, and one I think that we can pursue right through to the question of the cognition of, of the world. When Darwin was thinking about this problem, how could eyes have evolved, he was thinking only about the structure of the eye rather than the visual process. But you can extend the argument. Uh, if you really believe in natural selection, then as Darwin himself said, there is a big problem when you look at any complicated organ, hearts, lungs, kidneys, and so on, but, you know, particularly the eye. And the eye is a beautiful optical instrument, several optical components in it. It has a blood supply, external and internal blood supply. It has a neural retina, a hard external sclera, all derived from different parts of the embryo, all coming together to make this perfectly designed optical device. I mean, Darwin, in The Origin of Species, anticipated um, a criticism of natural selection. Here, to, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems freely confessed absurd. What he's saying is, how could you get to such a complicated structure by a small series of random inheritable changes, We're starting from a very, very simple beginning. Um, so he challenges his own theory, and beautifully, elegantly, eloquently, um, a few sentences later, um, dismisses his concern. <coughs> I leave it to you to, to read if your, if your special resolution is high enough. Um, he talks about gradations, if numerous gradations from a simple and imperfect eye to a complex one can be shown to exist. And the important thing is, if each step along the way from the very simplest form of light-catching organ, without a lens or anything, just, just responding to light, if, if each particular stage in this process was useful to the organism that had it, in the simplest sort of eye, then, and if there were inheritable variations in the eyes of individuals, and if there should be selective pressures that tended to conserve little changes that gave a slight advantage, then, you know, under changing conditions of life, it's the difficulty, as he says, of believing that perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection should not be considered as subversive of the theory. You can get to great complexity in small steps if each stage is useful to the organism that has it. Well, you can extend the same argument to anything that we do and think about, any act, that we carry out, uh, if you believe that genetics dominates the way our brains work and, and, and the way we behave. Um, so how do we, how could the understanding of the world that we have evolve? If you look at the eye of a human being, it's not remarkably different from that, let's say, of a frog. Um, frog's eye is 
what's called a simple eye, a typical vertebrate eye with a lens inside it and a single optical system, a retina at the back, an image that falls on the retina, photoreceptors, lots and lots of them pixelating the image and so on. But presumably, I mean, what a frog understands of the world around it and the way that it sees the world, if it, you know, if it consciously sees the world, is very different from the way that, that, that we do. Um, I was talking yesterday to people out at Queen Mary in the psychology department of Astrica and so on, who work on, on insects, on wasps and bees. Um, and there's some recent work showing that um, certain species of wasps can recognize the faces of other wasps. Um, particular species, subspecies of wasps that have complex interactions in social groups. In fact, they battle for, for hierarchical control of their colonies. And they can remember the face of individuals who've been very nasty to them in the past or very kind to them and remember them, uh, which is sort of spooky. And they've only got 5,000 omitidia, 5,000 pixels. Presumably they do it in a very different way from us. And I assume that they have very different visual experiences, but they get around in the world as they need to. So can we imagine that there's a kind of parallel process to, to, the, to the structural changes that underlie the progression of eyes and visual systems? And there are progressive changes in the cognitive understanding of the the world, each of them being useful to the organism that, that has that level of cognitive under, understanding, and there might even be inheritable variations in the level of cognitive understanding uh, mapped to genetic differences that could have been inherited. Um, in fact, the whole process of vision, even of making an eye, um, which I mean, I learned when I learned about comparative visual systems, I learned that the eye had been reinvented at least 15 times during evolution, quite independently. And that was based simply on the um, uh, on observations of the anatomical differences between different sorts of eyes. Insect eyes, omitidial eyes, um, cephalopod um, eyes, uh, spider eyes, using mirrors and so on, as opposed to vertebrate um, eyes. They're all very, very different in form. So it was assumed that each of these must represent a different <coughs> evolutionary lineage. It turns out that's almost certainly um, wrong. And the evidence for it comes from a you know, remarkable genetic, <coughs> genetic experiment showing that, that a particular transcriptional gene called PAC6, trans transcription factor, that is a gene that, that produces a protein that regulates other, other genes, um, is, a, is selectively expressed in the part of the head that's going to produce eyes. So, for instance, in the fruit fly, the PAC6 gene is turned on very early in the embryogenesis of the fruit fly in the region of the head. It's going to make eyes, and lone hold eyes are made there. And moreover, you can artificially express the gene in a different part of the head or even the body of a, of a fruit fly, and it will sprout an extra little eye in the place where you've turned on that gene. Now, if you compare the gene sequence with other species, you find that it's highly conserved. Very, the very similar sequences can be found in mice and in human beings. So this is the really incredible experiment. Here, the mouse, equivalent mouse gene, was induced, was expressed in the head of a fruit fly embryo, and it created <coughs> an extra little eye, a fruit fly eye, of course. Um, that gene was capable of taking over control of the production of an eye in that position, even though it's come from a mouse. And indeed, in the mouse, PAC6 gene is expressed in, in the developing head end of the embryo around where the eyes are, um, are formed. Here's the actual line that's been created. It's nothing like a mouse eye. It's, it's an omotidial eye. Lots and lots of facets, completely differently constructed, but basically turned on by the same, same gene. Um, and in humans, here in a human um, embryo, the yellow is a marker to show where this same human gene is being expressed. And there it is, very, very, the seven-week-old fetus being expressed in the developing eye, quite selectively, and not in the rest of the, uh, the, the, uh, the head. Um, and, and defects of, uh, oh, the way the gene was discovered was that, um, that there's a mouse, there's a, a fly mutation um, called eyeless, um, graphically, called eyeless, in which this gene has mutated, and it's a complete failure of formation of the eye. It doesn't happen in, in humans, but mutation of PAC6 but at least prevent the iris of the eye forming. So this is the eye of a person without um, um, a normal Pax 6 gene, and it hasn't got a normal um, eye. It's a huge, huge pupil. Amazing continuity of evolutionary time. I mean, they, 
I don't know, 100 million years or more, 200 million years probably, between the common ancestors of fruit flies and, and uh, mice, and yet um, uh, they share the same gene, which basically triggers the formation of very different animals. So eyes are ancient. Um, so we might imagine then that the origins of how we see the world could have, um, could have occurred equally early in evolutionary time. Um, but in the same way that our eye structurally is very different from that of um, a fruit fly, so our visual experiences might be, even if based on similar fragments of, of, the, of the cognitive processes. So how does vision work? I mean, that's a very ancient term, um, question, of course. Um, and uh, you know, it's not out of fashion these days. I think Descartes has, has a powerful influence still on thinking about that process for several reasons, and actually rather contradictory reasons. I mean, he, uh, I think he, he himself was um, um, varied considerably in, in the way that he said that he thought brains, eyes and brains worked. He was um, one of the first people to observe, directly observe the retina. I mean, not the first person by any means, but he performed this very simple experiment, which he described in uh, La, La Diotrique. Um, he took an eye, an ox, a fresh ox eye <coughs> from the local butcher, um, took it into a darkened room, cut a hole in the back of the sclera to expose the jelly of the eye behind, taking off the retina, blood vessels of the retina, exposing the jelly, and then put a piece of paper against the, um, the jelly to form a little lens and held the eye up to the window of his room um, and saw a lovely little image of the window formed on the paper in the back of the eye, upside down. And he draws the um, <coughs> optics correctly here to show that the retina image um, is inverted. Well, you know, imagine the impact that that observation must have had on, um, on a philosopher interested in, in epistemology, interested in how we gain our knowledge and understanding of the world, to see a, a, a dead bit of the body of an animal capturing uh, a neat little picture of the outside world. And he became quite you know, obsessed with that notion of the generation of, of pictures, and indeed imagined um, in, in um, the Traité de l'Homme, in uh, Tractus de Homine, imagined that that process of preserving a picture might continue into the brain. So here's this very fanciful view uh, of the brain. Here are the eyes, is the eye, each eye forming its own upside-down image of the outside world, and he imagines that the optic nerves, even though they have no idea how they, they worked, might somehow transmit, maybe by vibration, he thought, transmit a pattern into the brain which replicates the pattern of stimulation by light on the, on the retina. And you see that he thought it was a kind of um, parallel fibre optic bundle, almost, going in and impinging on the ventricles, on the surface of the ventricles of the brain. This is a um, fluid-filled chamber inside the, the, the brain, a very uh, inaccurate, completely <coughs> inaccurate representation of it, but he was, um, he was obviously... Um, Su supporting the classical so-called cell theory of brain function, the brain works, does its business um, by the distribution of fluid inside the, the brain rather than simply by the connections between nerve cells and nerve fibers and so on. So here, the, the, each eye formed its own pattern of activity, coherent isomorphic pattern of activity in the brain, still upside down, you'll notice, 246, 246 corresponds to that axis, um, and they set up vibrations in the fluid inside the, uh, the brain. And he says, um, there's this wonderful sequence in which, um, in La Diotrique, I think, in which he says, um, don't imagine that it is by virtue of the pictures inside the brain that we see the world. Because in order to do so, you would need another set of eyes inside the head to look at the pictures. So he saw the problem of the infinite regress. Just having a picture in the brain wasn't enough to explain seeing the world any more than having a picture in, in the eye explains um, vision. So what was the alternative? Well, uh, there were two alternatives, and he entertained both of them. And there was, again, this, this amazing um, sequence in, in, uh, in Traité de l'Homme in which he says, um, I want you to imagine that um, this entire machine, and he was referring to the human brain, the human brain, um, 
all of its actions, its thoughts, its imaginations, its senses, its appetites, everything, um, works automatically just like the motions of a clock. So, and he gave detailed accounts of different sorts of actions that we carry out, as if they were due purely to automatic, to the transmission of vibrations through the fluid inside the brain, impinging on other nerves, which then connected to muscles that just did things automatically and appropriately, like looking at objects. An object appears in your retina, it sets up a pattern inside your brain, that stimulates the movement of your eyes, and you look at it. But he realized, of course, that that wasn't seeing, and, and had said so very clearly, having a picture is not enough, might be enough to explain the actions, but isn't enough to explain the seeing as such. So, of course, he resorted to the notion of, of, of dualism, of a double process going on inside the brain, and here it is represented by the pineal gland inside the brain, which he thought of as being some kind of interface between the soul and, and, and the mechanical functions of the brain. Um, and you see that the, the patterns of vibration impinge on the soul, as it were, um, and need, <laughs> as they do so, reinvert, so that the soul doesn't have to come from turn on its head to see the world, and equally the two images just happen, because of the arrangement of ventricles, to converge precisely on aligned points. So the image is recombined into a single image of the outside world, reinverted. So another picture is formed, if you like, but this time the picture is on the soul, and the soul is the observer, so it doesn't it solves the problem of the infinite regress. Well, of course, nonsense, but that notion that there are two sorts of processes going on inside our heads, both of which are a sort of vision, um, is still very much with us. So let's follow the, the notion that the brain is, is simply the, the non-mystical part of the, the, the dualist equation. It is just a machine. It's a kind of computational machine for understanding the nature of the outside world on the basis of signals that I receive from the eyes and the approximation to a picture-like representation, which certainly exists <laughs> in the brain. You can look at the pattern of activity in the brain and sort of see that different bits of the visual field cause activity in the different parts of a spatially coherent representation. But that's meaningless. I mean, that doesn't actually convey any information. Um, that's just the input to a computational network that works out what's, what's going on out there. All right, so... Um, the region of the brain that we should then be interested in is the bit that receives from the eyes, and it's the back on the back of the head. That's been known for a very long time. Um, damage back here, a stroke, for instance, the back of your head can cause blindness, um, even if your eyes are perfectly normal, um, because that's where all the input arrives in the so-called primary visual cortex, and that's where you find this sort of Cartesian picture, not on the surface of the ventricles inside the brain, but but. Um, but on the grey matter, as it were, across the grey matter of the visual cortex. Um, the two people who have given us most insight into how that information is initially decoded um, are David Kubel and Torsten, who won the Nobel Prize in 1981. And they were the first people, um, well, effectively, um, to record from individual nerve cells in the visual cortex of cats and then in monkeys, um, in anaesthetized animals, watching the screen. They were intact animals, anaesthetized, maintained over for long periods of time while recordings were being taken from cells in their brains. Um, eyes were open, looking at a screen. So by moving images around on a screen in front of the animal's eyes, um, you could explore different parts of the retina, um, and, and, and therefore to present information to different parts of the visual cortex. So what they found was when they recorded them, this was one of their major, very exciting findings, 1962 finding, although this is from a later paper in the monkey, their first studies were in the cat. Um, they showed these sorts of pictures. Here's, um, here's a nerve cell recorded from one individual nerve cell. Um, it's an oscilloscope trace which has been photographed showing nerve impulses. These are the electrical impulses given off by the cell when a particular stimulus is presented in front of the eyes, and that's the stimulus, a dark bar on the screen in front of the animal's eyes, moving across a particular part of the screen, therefore across a particular bit of the retina, produces a burst of impulses. But the, and that would happen in, in, if you were recording 
from cells in the retina or cells in the kind of relay station on the way up to the, the cortex, they also respond to illumination in a particular part of the visual field, the so-called receptive field, a particular spot on the retina. But what was um, very different about cortical cells was that they required lines, not just pixels of light to respond, and they responded to a particular angle of a line and not to um, very different angles. So here's this particular cell, doesn't respond at all to horizontal or vertical, responds very well to an oblique line. So the, the cells are taking a, a, what is at first an image, just a light distribution of, of contrasts in the retinal image. That is com converted by the retina into a kind of pixel-like representation, like a digital camera, point-by-point -point representations of light, light level and color. That's transmitted backwards into the brain, pretty much as a point-by-point -point representation. But it arrives in the cortex, and a transformation begins, which is a sort of symbolic decoding of the spatial and temporal distribution of light patterns in the image. So here the neurons are not just looking for local light, they're looking for <coughs> particular features in the image. And different cells respond to different lines. In the monkey, some respond to different colours, movement, distances, and so on. So they're breaking down, kind of using a symbolic language, but breaking down the image into um, components and sending off messages according to whether those components are present or not. Right? Well, it turns out that there is not just one visual area. There are <coughs> dozens of them. I mean, in monkeys, almost certainly 25, 30 of them. In humans, more, almost certainly more than that. And that was, that was discovered by painstaking analysis using the same kind of technique recording around across the cortex. Um, some of it done by some of the most, the most important and early work done by Semi Ozeki at University College just around the corner. Um, so, what, what these people, this was mainly done in monkeys. This is a rhesus monkey the brain, a picture of the right hemisphere, a rhesus monkey, um, recording around with electrodes in different points across the brain. You can find that many different regions um, have neurons that respond to visual stimulation, even though they don't have direct input from the eyes. Nearly all the input comes into this primary visual cortex at the back, and then it gets redistributed to, or to, you know, onto these other relay stations around the cerebral cortex. Dozens of them, even for, for, for vision alone, more than half of the surface of the brain of a monkey is devoted exclusively or virtually exclusively to vision, to the analysis of vision. Even though the information all comes into that first area. That's an intriguing point because you, you know, they're, they're, everything that the brain could possibly know about is already there in the first visual area. Nothing, no, no additional information can be added. It's restricted by what gets into the first area. So why have all this other stuff? And why during evolution have more and more and more of these additional modules been added? Because certainly they have. Um, well, I think the answer is, is pretty clear when you look at the sorts of things that interest the cells in these different areas. I mean, take, for instance, this um, area in the middle, um, which is called um, MT, the middle temporal area, or V5. Semi exactly calls it V5. Relatively small um, area, which is actually out of sight on the surface because it's buried down in, in, a, in, a, in a cleft in the brain. So it's a little tiny area. Um, it's quite clearly concerned with the analysis of movement, moving images. Every nerve cell that you record in, in that region responds selectively to movement in one direction in space. And the cells respond in different directions. And beautiful work by Bill Newsom in awake monkeys with electrodes implanted so that they could be doing uh, perceptual tasks and things while recordings are being taken. He, he, um, he recorded from this area, got his microelectrode tip close to the group of neurons that responded to movement in one direction, one part of the visual field, and then injected a local anaesthetic to turn off that particular group of neurons, tiny cluster of neurons, <coughs> while the monkey was making perceptual discriminations in that bit of the visual field, and found that doing that um, reduced the animal's capacity to detect movement in that, in that direction, this sort of blindness for motion in that particular region of the visual, temporarily in that region of the visual field. So this is clearly something that, to do with the animal's actual behaviour related to the vision of movement. 
And the properties of these cells are different from those in the primary area, even though it's the primary area that produces the input to this, they, are, they have bigger receptive fields, they're looking over a wider region of space. In other words, they're looking at the correlation of activity across neurons, the, the temporal and spatial distribution of activity across neurons in this area. So the information's already <coughs> there, but it's not made, as the jargon now goes, not made explicit in the activity of individual cells in the area. It only exists by virtue of the relationship of activity between them, and that is then spotted by cells in these other areas. Okay, so they are looking for interesting extra bits of information that are present in the, uh, in the pattern in the first area. So this is, um, you, know, you, can, you can start to make, and many people have, arguments about the computational properties of this sequence from the retina to V1 to MT, and then onwards into other motion processing um, areas um, in terms of the animal's perception, and not so much its perception, its action in response to moving stimuli. All right, well, if the brain then is a visual um, uh, computer, let's just pursue that metaphor. Um, uh, MRI imaging, and, you know, we're sitting uh, a, a, a few tens of metres away from, the, from a kind of temple of neuroimaging in Queen Square, much of the early work and, and the most influential work was done there. Um, MRI uh, has really helped enormously to um, provide evidence for analogous processes in the brains of human beings compared with those of animals. It, it is not a substitute for the kind of information that can be gained from um, recording experiments with microelectrodes. It's, it's uh, a thousand times less sensitive in terms of spatial dimensions and more than a thousand times less in, in terms of temporal resolution than the kinds of events uh, that single nerve cells are performing. Um, I mean, single nerve cells are tenth of a millimeter or something across, and they fire impulses that last a millisecond. Spatial resolution of fMRI is a couple of millimeters at best, and, um, and the temporal resolution is, is five, ten seconds or more. But at least it enables you to see where things are going on. And if that correlates with what's happening in a monkey, then you can be fairly confident that the processes are similar and, and are evolutionarily analogous. So when it comes to, to motion, for instance, very clear, if you ask someone to lie in the scanner and you just show them a static pattern of contrast, black and white blobs or something like that, just stationed on a screen, and compare the blood flow activity in there, because that's what this is measuring, in their brain, for that compared with looking at a blank screen or, or looking at nothing, then you see activity in the back of the brain, including the, the primary visual cortex, where you, where you expect it to be. But if you now move that pattern around on the screen and ask what parts of the brain now are turned on that were not turned on by the static pattern, then you get a different picture. You get um, activity further forward. There's MT, the equivalent area to MT, and the rubber region is even more anterior. Um, that's, that's, that's human MT, and, in, and there's a lot of evidence that it's analogous to the, the um, monkey area. Damage in humans, bilateral damage in that region, can produce a selective blindness for, for motion, a kind of toxia, as it's called. All right. Well, if then, and, and here it is in a, in a rendered, you know, three-dimensional view of the human brain, that's, that's empty. It's just above the ears, just here. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can zap it with a technique called um, transcranial um, uh, magnetic stimulation. You can just put a little pulse of magnetism in there. Which, which produces electrical activity inside the brain and disrupts the neural activity temporarily. Um, and if you do that, it, it, it can interfere with detection of, of, uh, of movement in, in a conscious um, human. Again, good evidence like the Newsom experiment in monkeys that it's right in the mainstream of visual processing of movement. Okay, well, there's, there's a logical problem here then. Pursuing the computational argument, um, and if these neurons are just responding to the motion of a pattern across the retina, um, and trying to interpret that in terms of the movement of objects in the outside world, then there's a basic um, problem, basic confound. Um, how does it tell the difference between um, uh, movements of the image which are produced by eye movements and movements of the image that are caused by object movements? If you're looking at something and it moves backwards and forwards, then its image moves across your retina. But if you're looking at a static object and you move your eyes backwards and forwards, if you can track them across smoothly, then the image also moves across the retina. So 
So we've just got an image moving on the retina. How do these neurons know? Because when you do that, if you move your eye backwards and forwards, the, the object doesn't appear to move. Okay? Because you know that your eyes are moving. So uh, can, it, is the brain capable of doing Well, obviously the brain is capable of performing some kind of algorithm, some kind of computation to tell the difference between a very simple piece of algebra to tell whether the motion of the retinal image is being caused by, by the eye moving or by the object moving. Well, is it possible MT does that? And I'll just describe an experiment done by um, uh, Loriana Santoro, who is a graduate student of, uh, of mine. Um, and this is just a kind of snapshot of, uh, of part of her, her work. She put people in the scanner and showed them an array like that. And in a completely dark room, um, she looked at, the person looked at a TV screen with white bars on it and a white cross in the middle. And she just, the only instruction was, keep your eyes on the cross, whatever happens. Right? And she looked at the activity in the brain. It was produced. So here you are. This is first stimulus. You're looking at the cross. The bars are moving backwards and forwards. The bars appear to be moving. Okay? And they are moving. The image is moving on your retina, obviously, because your eye is stationary. Right? Classic stimulus, and it produces massive activity in MT. Here it is, human, the human equivalent of MT, really zapping in, um, in response to that. But what about this? This is, um, keep your eyes on the cross. Now the cross is moving, exactly the same temporal pattern that the bars were moving. The bars are stationary. Your eyes moving, backwards and forwards, so the bars are moving on your retina, but you don't see them move, of course, because your own eye is moving. You know it's moving, and, and therefore it, every, the outside world is static. Somehow you subtract out the effect of your own eye movements. Well, so does MT. MT is not activated in that condition, even though the retinal stimulus is identical. So MT must know about eye movements, and it does. There's a big input from eye movement control system, and it must be cancelling out quite effectively the visual input. Now, here's a critical experiment. Look at the cross again. Now, the cross and the bars are moving together. You follow the cross. The bars appear to be moving, right? And you're tracking them, backwards and forwards. But if you think about it, if your eyes tightly locked on the cross, then the images of the bars aren't moving on your retina at all. Right? You're just moving along with them. They're fixed on your retina, just as if they were fixed in space. But if the brain knows that your eye is moving, the computation, the algebra, would say, OK, no retinal movement, eye is moving, therefore the target must be moving exactly the same way that the eye is, is moving. Um, and in that condition, MT responds. Some part of MT, anyway, responds strongly. So he's doing the computation even when there's no retinal movement at all. If it expects retinal movement, it responds. So it's good, good evidence that, um, following the computational argument, that this structure is computing what you would expect to see, what the, the person to be seeing. And it's computing what is happening in the outside world, not in the image. Okay. Um, let's look at some, some other features and then see how this sort of argument intersects with the experience of seeing. Because nothing that I've described in that little analysis of MT requires the person to have had any visual experience. <coughs> their, their head contains a signal which tells the brain about, activi about movement in the outside world, which could be usefully used by the brain, but no, it's not necessary for them to see it. Let's go to things that are more closely related to seeing. Um, if you, um, this is some work of Tim Andrews in my lab. If you show people a sequence of photographs of faces, real um, photographs of people's faces, 10 seconds each, randomly interleaved with photographs of objects, <coughs> and objects, okay? just 10 seconds, one after the other, random. And you simply say to the computer, you know, show me the areas of the brain that were more strongly turned on by these images than by these images and vice versa. Then you get nice pictures. Um, nothing very novel about, about this. Here, this is a horizontal section through the brain. You see the eyes at the front. So this is lower down than MT. Uh, this is the top of the temporal lobe um, in a region called the fusiform cortex, fusiform gyrus. And this small, relatively small area here, centimeter or so across, um, is very strongly turned on by the faces compared with the objects. And as it happens, in the same section, there's a region not very far away, the parahippocampal gyrus, which responds more to the objects, the faces. Now, people have made lots of arguments that this area is selective for faces and is, is closely involved in the processing of face information. 
Um, and damage in this region produces um, a condition called cosopagnosia, which is an um, inability to recognize faces, so they're not kind of fits. Um, this region, though, is, is almost certainly not crucially involved in the perception of, of objects. It happens to respond more to objects than faces in this particular experimental design, um, but it's not selective for objects. It's probably actually selective for more for external views of spaces and places than for individual objects, but with this particular stimulus design, it responds more to the objects. Shows some of the dangers, by the way, in interpreting these MRI um, experiments. Anyway, we've got, and there are other areas also that respond to objects that might be more, might be more centrally involved in recognizing man-made objects. But anyway, if we just have these two areas and now ask the computer to focus on those two and, and track them, we can see how their activity correlates with what the person actually sees. Um, and I'll come back to that question. If you hold it in your head, I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, the, the, the notion that, that vision must be more than interpreting the retinal image alone, or just reproducing the retinal image alone, is an obvious one which has been recognized for a long time. Um, and it's clear that that vision requires, I mean, what vision is about is not about telling you what's happening in your head or about telling you what's present on your retina. It's about telling you about the world outside you. It's a, it's a process some, some people have called reverse optics. Taking the optics, pushing it through the brain in order to reverse the optics to try to find out what kind of, to try to guess what kind of thing in the <coughs> outside world might have generated the object that happens to fall on your retina. Okay, so um, there's, there, are, there, there are certain situations in which the, I mean, in most circumstances, we don't have the impression that there's any problem in deducing from the retinal image what the object out there in the external world is that made that image. In other words, there's no uncertainty associated with what you see for most of the time around the room, and almost instantaneously you see things that appear to be faces, doors, clocks, and so on. You don't sort of th look at things and think, now is it a face or a clock? And then and gradually you learn more about it and it becomes more obvious that, that it's a face than a clock, and so on. Even though any retinal, any retinal image of any object is infinitely ambiguous, at least as to the three-dimensional shape of the real object that generated it. Since the retinal image is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional object, there is no way in which that single two-dimensional image can precisely specify or define what the object was that generated it. Every retinal image is ambiguous. But we don't have problems with ambiguity uh, most of the time because the interpretations are, the probability of interpretation is biased so much towards <coughs> the kinds of things that we've seen in the past. And I'll come back to that in a second. But there are situations in which there are clearly problems with this process. And here, here we have Salvador Dali exploiting that issue of ambiguity in this, uh, this painting um, called um, um, The Bust of Voltaire or The Slave Market. It has two titles for obvious reasons because this funny, and you, you, know, you, will, you will know this, I'm sure, and many of you will have seen this already. The, this funny area here can, have, can take two forms in your perceptual experience. And those at your back of the room might be persistently seeing it as a bust um, on a stand, right? With the chin and the eyes and so on. But those nearer will either be alternating their views or seeing it more often as um, a group of little figures, two characters <coughs> here with white ruffs around their heads and sort of aprons and things, and a strange character standing here with a long black cloak on, yes? So that's a slave market, I suppose. Um, and it's deliberately painted to represent two different things and to be ambiguous. And it's right, whatever you think of Dali, it's really very clever draftsmanship to be able to generate um, an ambiguous image like this. And it also is, when, once you know those two things, if you're at the right distance anyway, you can't stop it flipping backwards and forwards between the two, yes? So, um, what's happening as you, in your head? as you are sometimes seeing this as a single face and other times seeing it as, um, as images. And by seeing, of course, I mean you, the interpreter, this has nothing to do with physics. The retinal image is always the same. So the changes that are happening, vivid though they are, are entirely within, your, in the, realm, within the realm of experience. Um, well, it's difficult to ask that kind of question with a complex image, but you can do it with a simple one. 
and you're all familiar with this, so the Rubens uh, illusion, the glass face illusion, again, it appears to flip between um, a pair of profile faces and a vase, right? Well, that's interesting. Um, a vase is a man-made object, and faces are faces. So what about those two areas um, which respond more to faces and to vases? What Tim Andrews uh, did, was, and Dennis Schlupek, was to um, do an event-related sort of paradigm, looking at the tracking the activity in these two areas continuously, while the person was looking at that ambiguous vase face illusion, and the person had uh, two buttons to press, and they pressed one when it changed in their mind's eye from vase to face, and the other one when it changed from face to vase, and they were able to look at the changes in activity in those two regions as those flips in consciousness occur. Nothing to do with the image on the retina or the outside world, there's internally generated changes in perceptual interpretation. And what they saw was that, um, this is for three subjects, the, the black bars are the bold activity that occurred at the time of a change, it, and this is in the fusiform face area specifically, at the time when it suddenly appeared to change from vase to faces. And the white bar is the activity when it suddenly appeared to change from faces to vases. In each case, um, uh, considerably significantly less for the shift from a face to a vase than from a vase to a face in the face area. The same was not true in the so-called object uh, region. That did not reliably predict what the person was seeing. Uh, these, these voxels did. If you track those voxels without knowing about the bush and button pushes, you could predict with 85 90% reliability whether the person was seeing the pattern as a face or as, as a vase. Um, so here we're seeing brain activity in areas that are associated with particular <coughs> interpretations of the retina correlating with an internal interpretation of what's there. Okay, so vision is this search for, um, for meaning. Um, and remember that there are the parts of the brain which appear to be devoted to the analysis of, of, of faces. So just a little experiment. If you just look at um, this... Um, ah, no, all right, well, Right, yes, do look at this, but it's not quite what I was going to show you. This, this is one of the um, first uh, in images from an orbital spacecraft from the Viking uh, mission to Mars in the 70s. And when this image was, was transmitted back and the newspapers were filled with it, was, there was enormous speculation in the popular press about some kind of message from space. Here was a face impressed on the surface of Mars. And in fact, this is 400 kilometers long. Um, it didn't seem to, you know, to um, impress people. Uh, we're very fond of seeing faces in things. It's very clear that faces are extremely important to human beings. We have that big chunk of brain that seems to be there to, to analyse them. Um, uh, so you know, we're very willing to interpret retinal images that even approximate faces as being, as being face-like. Face um, this is in the Daily Star, <laughs> the face of Jesus found in a frying pan. And um, it's the internal story of a close-up of Jesus' face. And the text is nice. Uh, it says, um, The gravel worker said he was discussing with his wife, Mary Lou, and son, Juan Jr., about whether to sell the pan. We might well sell it, but we're really not sure what to do at the moment. We're still a bit shocked about it all. Two months ago, a woman from Florida who discovered an image of the Virgin Mary in her toasted cheese sandwich <laughs> sold it on eBay £14,000. <laughs> Yeah, so easy to see faces. Um, just this point about, you know, I mean, you can ask why, why, why are faces important? Why are we so willing to um, imagine that rudimentary information in a, in a scene might represent a face? And people have um, speculated for a long time this, this, this could have to do with with experience and the habitual experience of seeing other faces. And certainly there's lots of evidence that the way in which we interpret and disambiguate the retinal image has a large amount to do with what we know about the world from past experience. I mean, this disambiguation problem is a really important one. And one way in which you can get around it is by simply learning from experience what retinal images habitually, usually, correspond to. Well, one of the things that can help you to um, disambiguate is to look at the, the patterning and the shapes of shadows that are generated by three-dimensional surfaces. 
But to do so, you have to make assumptions about where the light is coming from. And the only way you can make such assumptions is on the basis of a regular experience. This was, a, this was a, um, a picture I saw in the Independence in 1999 uh, when a fossilized footprint was discovered, human footprint. And here it is, that was the picture as it appeared, an imprint showing a boy's footprint over 25,000 years old, discovered in a cabin in southern France. Fantastic. I looked at it and thought, well, it doesn't look to me like a footprint. <laughs> so that looks like a kind of funny cast of a, of a foot. Until I realised that they had printed the photograph, if you like, <clears throat> upside down. And instantly it appears like a footprint. There are the toes imprinted into the, into the soil, yes? The foot, the heel and so on. Agreed? Go back. Um, let's go back to the original there. Looks like the, the toes are lumps and bumps sticking up out of the ground. And here, the same photograph, they look like impressions in the ground. The picture isn't changing, the image isn't changing, just the distribution of the shadows within it, the direction, the assumed direction of the light. We interpret images like this, assuming that the light's coming from above, not from, um, from below. Um, and that's what makes the original picture, in this case, just look wrong. There it is. Um, well, you, could, you can pursue this kind of computational argument and build a simplified view of what vision is. An image comes in, bits of it are, are just described symbolically, the interpretation is applied to the bits of the image, they are labelled as to objects, and that's what vision is. But vision is much more than just the sum of its parts. I'll show you an example of that. Now, that was a picture of, that many of you will have seen this, before. There's a picture of a face, yes? What was the um, expression on the face? Smile. Face? In every other respect, the face looked perfectly normal, yes? Upside down, of course, but, but, but smile. Well, this is what you actually saw. <laughs> this is the face you actually saw, um, and there it is, upside down. And if you think about it, it must be because the smile's the the right way up, but the face is upside down. So, you know, if you really look at this, it's been, it's been you know, computation, it's been photoshopped to turn the smile and the eyes upside down. Um, Pete Thompson in uh, York first described this oh, in the 80s in a beautiful paper in Perception. And he used as the image, this, that was in the early 80s when you know, Mrs. Thatcher was, you know, doing, doing her damage to the education system the universities and he wrote this paper called The Margaret Thatcher Illusion and he used a picture of Margaret Thatcher as the basis of this, <laughs> this illusion. <coughs> Brave man. Um, so, quite clearly, although this appears as a kind of gestalt, it's a whole, it's a whole face, the smile must be, logically, must be being analysed separately from the face. Somewhere the brain is putting the two together to make the impression that you have a whole bound together smiling face it's quite obvious that the two things have been handled um, separately and reassembled somewhere in your perception. Just an aside, um, uh, the pressures in evolution to make efficient visual systems are very considerable because seeing costs an awful lot. It, o it occupies a large part of your brain, the monkey brain, your brain too, about a third of your cerebral cortex. So it costs a lot metabolically. <laughs> Um, in humans, about 20,000 million neurons are devoted to, to vision, and uh, 2,000 billion connections. Uh, nerve impulses are metabolically very expensive, it takes a lot of ATP to, to drive them. In fact, about 4% of all the food that you eat is used to see. So, you know, if you're worried about your weight, um, forget about all those, you know, fat and glass and all this business. Just, just go to a movie. <laughs> so, the issue, if there's this drive on economy during evolution, because vision is expensive, even though there's an awful lot of machinery, um, how could there be mechanisms to minimise or economise on the machinery needed for all that computation? Um, and that reduces the question of how much we really do see. If, if our internal processing, which generates what we see of the world, is only, in some ways, rather loosely related to what's striking the retina, and ambig ambiguous images suggest that, 
then in normal circumstances, how much of what's hitting the eye actually is entering what we see? There's a process of seeing which seems very complete and dense and detailed, but to what extent is it dependent on a complete, exhaustive analysis of the retinal image? So how much do we really see? Well, there's now a great um, deal of literature um, from you know, cognitive psychologists principally showing that we, we actually process much less of the image than we imagine we do. Now, let me show you this simple demonstration. If you just look at this, imagine you're driving your car along and it's, it obviously isn't a, 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 a stormy day, but imagine it is, and the car in front of you throws some mud up onto the screen of your car, like this. It splashes the screen of your car. Now, what did you see? You saw the blobs of mud appear. Did you see anything else happen in the image? Right? So, uh, let's just repeat it without the, um, the mud. There's the first image, there's the second image. <laughs> That's the transition that took place. If we go back to the original one with the mud, you'll see it. Just look at the stripes. And if you say, well, you don't see it. Now, that's an incredibly strong visual stimulus. Think of all the, neuron, you know, the edge-sensitive neurons in your visual cortex buzzing away furiously as that new bunch of lines appears. You don't see them. So how is that? So the normal interpretation is that there must be some kind of attention gating going on, and the sudden appearance of these unexpected things captures your attentional mechanisms and stops you seeing these, diverts your attention to one or other of the areas where the thing has happened and stops you seeing the rest. Well, that's, that's odd, because we know from many experiments that attention, at any one moment, attention is usually restricted to quite a small part of the visual field, usually around the point you're actually looking at. It doesn't have to be. You can pay attention to things which are not where your eyes point. Most of the time, you're just attending to the thing you're actually looking at. What about all the rest? Is all the rest always in the state that that white line was in, in this particular experiment? Um, well, there's quite a lot of evidence. It probably is. But we see really very little of what's going on. Now, um, uh, it gets worse. Because the, eye, the gradient of receptors across your retina and the gradient of the ganglion cells that send their fibers back to the brain is very heterogeneous in, in humans, in primates, in, in all animals that have highly mobile eyes and can look around. Um, the concentration of receptors, particularly the cones, the, light, the ones that work in high illumination cones, um, is much, much, much greater right in the central fovea of the retina um, and falls off very rapidly into the periphery. And that's the high resolution part that you point at things when you want to look at them. as you know, the kind of resolution which can enable you to read a newspaper in <coughs> fine detail um, and also in colour as well because the cones are responsible for colour. But the density of those things collapses very, very quickly into the periphery. So, although the room, as you look at just imagine, you look at this room, it, it doesn't look as though everything's all blurry towards the edges. It doesn't look as though there's no colour in the edges and only in the middle. But in reality, if you challenge people with appropriate tests of what they can see, then that's the way it is. So all of the detail of the periphery is somehow being added on the basis of assumptions about what's there, with the crudest amount of real information that's coming in. That's one thing. Then there's this attention thing. Our attention is also limited to a small patch, patch of space, usually coincident with where our favorite is pointing, and the non-attention to the rest helps even more to blank it out. On top of that, the eye isn't stationary. It's moving, and usually it doesn't move in these nice smooth ways that I was describing for that experiment on MT. It's jumping around, whether you know it or not. Most of the time you're not aware of it. Your eye's moving approximately three times a second, you're making saccadic step-like movements. Most of them quite small, half a degree or a degree or something like that, but big ones occasionally if you move to look at something interesting. So you're getting these snapshots of little concentrations of visual evidence in different parts of the field. Three times a second, and that is the basis of, of what you're seeing. But, well, you can try and simulate that. And this is um, a simulation that Peter Neary, who's in Aberdeen and I, did. Uh, this is just a very crude movie um, taken with a, cam sorry, with a handheld camera being moved around roughly with the movement of the head looking 
around at different things. So it's sweeping. I'll just play it for you. It's sweeping. So it's on the promenade des Anglais in, in, uh, in, in Nice. Gosh, I hope I can. Oh, dear. Ah, right. Yep. So this is the head-centered overall view of a scene. Okay? Now, you could say, well, there's all that mass of information. How, how could it be processed in a way that would simplify what's going on? Well, first of all, it might be reduced to its lines and its edges in the way that the visual cortex does. So here's a, um, a rendition of, of that scene, filtered so as to, sh to show only the transition points of illumination, the contrasts of the image, and to blank out this, this, the areas of difference of overall illumination. So this is basically just a spatial filtering of the image to show the boundaries and the edges. And that's part of what the visual cortex is doing. Let's just see whether we can make that go. Ah, OK, so it jumps up into the top corner. Sorry about that. Difference between Mac and PC. But here's the image up at the top there. That's a processed image of this which shows only the boundaries and the edges. And that's removing a great deal of unwanted information from that, and that's what the retina and the cortex um, do in part. But the problem is that they're doing it with an input which is filtered by the gradient of the photoreceptors in the eye and, and by the attentional mechanism, which is not represented here. So what, the, what is really hitting the brain from the eyes, from the optic nerve, for that exactly the same scene is something like this. This is an image, this is the same image, but it's been filtered in a way that simulates the change in density of the ganglion cells across the retina. So the fovea is looking at one particular bit and jumping around about three times a second. So this is what the brain's really receiving as you're walking along that street in Promenade des Anglais. Jumping from point to point. And finally, you have to think of it from the cortex's point of view. That's from the input to the brain, but the cortex is sitting there where each bit of it is looking at a particular bit of the retina. So if you say, what is the foveal representation of the cortex receiving at any one time? I mean, here at least you can see the whole scene, and you see where the eye is going to in different areas, so you can kind of build up an overall picture. But that's not what the brain's getting. Each, each part of the brain is looking at the input from one bit of the retina, which most of the time is this stuff. And occasionally it just happens that the... Um, well, no, sorry... Most of the visual cortex is looking only, ever looking at this kind of input. But the fovea, a fovea representation is looking at the high resolution stuff, but the eye is jumping from image to image all the time. So what it's getting is something like this, if it works. And this was the movie that I put in at the last moment, so it might not. I hope it does. Yes, it does. So this is what the, fove the input, the foveal representation of the cortex would be like. It's getting these snapshots of little bits of the visual scene depending on where the eye happens to jump to. And, it ha and it's got to try and put that together to make that coherent image comparable to the video that I first showed you. But it's really a very daunting and challenging task. Okay, so let's describe finally an experiment. This experiment I did with, with um, V.S. Ramachandran a few years ago, which we still haven't published, we ought to, really, which is um, asking the question, if, if the eye is moving around, jumping around, capturing information for short periods of time um, and then getting another bit of information on each bit of the retina. How good is it, good is it at, at retaining the snapshot of information that it's got? Because you'd, seem, you'd think that at least it's got to do that in order to try to piece together these successive snapshots to make a coherent overall view. It's taking little snapshots point by point. If you could retain each of them and put them together like a jigsaw puzzle, then maybe you can get some kind of overall picture. But can we do that? So this is the experiment we did. We um, asked people to look at an array like this. We asked them to look at the black star in the middle, but actually it doesn't depend crucially on where they look. But let's imagine you look at the black star in the middle. And there are a number of geometrical shapes, colored shapes around the outside. You look at that for a few seconds, and suddenly, without warning, it jumps, simulating the effect of you making a microsaccadic eye movement. Um, now, it jumped. You saw it jump, of course. Did you see anything else? I mean, was there anything unusual? Try again. It's going to jump again. 
put up your hands if you saw something odd. Okay, so a few. And again, any more? Yes, a few. Here and there, most of you not. All right, let me describe them. What if you? I'm going to repeat the sequence now. Um, but if you attend, in other words, shift your attention to the one which is indicated by the arrow, I'm now going to reproduce exactly the same sequence that you've just seen before. So watch carefully. So it changed shape. And that happened before, but very, very few of you saw it. And now pay attention to this one. <coughs> that again changed shape. And this one changed color. And this one changed shape. So you are, even with these tiny jumps, 30 seconds, 30 minutes of arc across the retina, you're unable to retain the information about what was there before. And this depends on how many elements there are in the, the array. If it's only one, you always see the change because you've only got one thing to attend to. This very much depends on how many things you can attend to. So using this kind of technique, we were able to calculate roughly how much information you retain from your retina each time your eye moves and your eye is moving three times a second. And the answer is about 50 bits of information. 50 bits of information out of the megabytes of information in the whole retinal image. So, um, this um, problem is undoubtedly the explanation for this other type of example of, of what's called change blindness. Look at this image, just look at it very carefully. It's going to jump. Is it going to change? Okay, I'll jump it back again. Some of you might just be seeing this, and this is what's actually happening. I'll do it without the jump. I'll make the same change, but without the jump. Here it is. There's the first one, and there's the <laughs> second one. <laughs> that was happening between those two images, and you're entirely unaware of them just because it shifted to a different part of the retina. But if that, of course, means it shifted to an entirely different part of your visual cortex, the second bit of visual cortex knows nothing about what was going on in the first image. So it's not really that surprising. Being able to detect it would require your brain to remember and retain everything about the original image, construct it, then compare it slavishly with a completely new interpretation with a new bit of brain of the new image. So the conclusion from this is that our vision depends on collecting this sequence by sequence, highly filtered and concentrated set of snapshots of little parts of the field, rapidly extracting from them a small amount of crucial information, not detailed, a small amount of crucial information, depending on what you, what's deemed to be important, important enough to attend to, and then zapping onto the next thing and doing the same stuff. That's the basis of what you see of the world. So all, almost everything you see. So we don't live in this kind of continuous, perfect moving of reality that vision appears to me. There is no past. There's no past to your visual experience. There is only a present. And it's a, a very shallow present with very little information. And the part that reconstructed your past is based almost entirely on assumptions, presumably on the basis of past experience, and these tiny fragments of stuff you actually remember from previous scenes of what's out there. And that creates the illusion of the, of the image that we see. And so the final question is, why bother? If we can explain so much of what we do with our visual systems, as Descartes tried to do, on the basis of thinking of the brain as a computational machine, why bother with all the issue of trying to make an image as well? And having to have special sorts of systems for topping it up from past experience and disambiguating and all this sort of stuff. Why have conscious experience? Very much. I'm glad to see science is well funded enough to take you to Nice to the problem of long way to make the video. Um, <laughs> no, no, it took, it, took someone, <laughs> it took someone who put the movie up on YouTube to, to probably not be, unfortunately. We, we've got just a, a little bit of time, maybe for one or two mm -hmm. questions. If we That's okay. Okay. Don't need to rush. Maybe you should let people go who want to go. Yes, one? if anybody would like to mm -hmm. take advantage of a bit of a gap, please do. And the rest of you can be thinking of questions.
Rods are only active in dark conditions. So in these conditions, your rods are not contributing in any way to what you're, what you're seeing. They're totally saturated. So um, everything's restricted to cones. The cones are highly concentrated in the middle. It has got cones in the periphery, but they're at really 2% of the density that's in the middle. But there must be something that pulls your attention. Yeah. That's an interesting point, yeah. So there is, and you can record, if you put an electrode into the brain and record from a part of the cortex which is connected to the peripheral retina, it's having to deal with that very low cone density and very low ganglion density. And they respond, they're, they're selective to orientations and lines and things. They have big receptive fields and they can only detect large um, objects with low, very low spatial frequencies of patterns and so on, but they do exactly the same kinds of things that are done by the cells that are looking at the high resolution input in the middle, but they're doing it on a very fine scale. Yeah. So sorry, it will be a terminological question. But, uh, so you used the term assumption uh, several times during the talk in the first and one of them was during the, the footprint, saying that our visual system assumes that light is coming from above. So it seems that assumptions are necessary to sort of they go with features and make, mm. make sense of even the small part of the image. And then you talk about assumptions helping to fill in the gaps, the sort of frequency with the, the mm. image. So you want to stick to the same term being used in the two? Well, I mean, it's a different it's process, but it's the same. And what yeah, are assumptions then? Yeah, okay. So the assumptions that, um, that are used for filling in um, could simply be extrapolations, essentially. It could be based on the uh, on the, 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 you know, the, on the liter are literally assuming that the kinds of things that are that are happening now are similar to those that have happened in the past, or the kinds of things that have happened in the past are similar to those that are happening now. That's why you get the sense of continuity. And the kinds of things that are present in the middle of your field are, are likely to be in reality similar to the things that are happening in your periphery. So although you have very low resolution and poor color descriptions really coming from the periphery, you know about your visual system and you just assume that in reality that they're really coloured and sharp, just like the things that we know about in the middle. Assumptions about the physical world underpin so what's usually called top-down processing of, of I mean, perhaps interpretation would be better than assumption. It must be based on, on, on um, rules, probabilistic rules about the likelihood of the nature of the external world patterns of illumination, solidity, the kinds of shapes which are easy to make and which exist, the fact that you know, buildings, for instance, tend to come in straight lines, and there are lots of horizontals and verticals and, and, and orthogonal junctions in our sort of engineered world. Those sorts of assumptions based on the, the accumulation of past experience about the nature of physical objects certainly influences the way that you decode the information that's coming from, from, the, from the world, even in the high resolution bit. You have to have that to disambiguate the two-dimensional image. Fiona. Um, so you said that there's no past in uh, visual experience, but there are some interesting cases which suggest maybe there are. So um, Parvan Singer at uh, MIT has shown that if you show people um, an ambiguous moving stimulus, people are very unlikely to interpret it in certain ways. But if you show them in advance a series of images of one object, then they will go on just in virtue of having a few seconds of seeing um, these pictures, they will go on and interpret that moving stimulus in a very particular way that they would have done before as kind of one whole uh, yep. coherent object. So in that case it looks like past experience is influencing... No, but it's this assumption sort of process. Um, what I was saying was that the, you know, the video that we live in has no real past. 
of the you can bias present interpretation by what has happened in the past, but that biasing must be based on the sort of condensed symbolic representation of the current reality that I was trying to describe. So we're, we're catching, I mean, uh, we, we, if you watch a movie, a real movie, um, same kind of processes must be, you're, you're using your visual system to try to interpret things that are up on the screen in front of you. Um, so there's sort of two layers of process there. There's no problem in recognizing when there's been a cut in a movie. It's a different view or a different scene. In no sense do you have the feeling that it's, it is just one continuous process because you're completely unaware of the past. So you must be retaining enough about what you've just seen to be able to know whether what you're now seeing is different from it, whether there's been a sudden disjunction, but, but not enough to support the illusion of this continuity of perception that we, that we have. And I think the change blindly sort of experiment show that very clearly. So I've got one, two, three, four. Yeah, David. Can, can, I, <coughs> can I press you a bit on, on your terminology of filling in? I, I wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to understand by that. So, so take peripheral conscious awareness that there, there's colours out there. Mm. And so well, I've got an assumption that there's colours out there that they're definitely covered. And but you you seem to thought is it on the basis of that assumption I then did something else like perhaps made visually sensitive neurons or colour sensitive neurons yeah. for that part of the visual field start yeah. firing. But I yeah. take it that Well I think I that, that's a real possibility. That's but, a real but, possibility. But, 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 but hang on, I mean if you press me on what colour this card over here is, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. won't turn out to have a definite uh, opinion on that. So I mean, of course, not. if you haven't got enough information to make the judgment, then obviously you couldn't make it reliable. That's true. So why not just stop with the assumption that there are colours out there and definite things, and okay. uh, this is the, that, that constitutes my conscious awareness? And why suppose there's any further process? Well, I mean, it's, it, you know, this is a semantic question. It depends what you really, what I really meant by the term filling in, and I did not, and I did not mean. I mean, literally, uh, paint my numbers. I'm going to put the extra stuff in that's not there, but filling in in the, in the sense of something happening to generate in your subjective interpretation of the world an impression that something's in present, which clearly is not supported or justified by the information arriving at that time from the retina. Well, it's not wrong that there are definite objects out there with colours on, I and mean, I'm not wrong about that. No, but, still we can't, but we can't be, there's no way in which you can be reliably sure of what those colours are, with that colour information the eye, but we can have the impression that they are coloured. And, in challenge, uh, and until challenged, those impressions of colour are just as distinct and real as the much more reliable ones that come from the area where you've got lots of cones. But I agree, used to the uh, filling in is, 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 is loose and very different from the way in which it's normally used to describe the way in which the blind spot, for instance, can somehow appear to have stuff in it um, which is just based on interpolation between the stuff that's around the edges of it. Yeah, that's right. Um, you asked the question, what, what is consciousness for? But um, what do you say consciousness to be in a denotational sense? <laughs> <laughs> it's a small question. Yes, yes, that is a question. Yes, yes. Well, I, perhaps I um, did need to get away earlier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, come on, I don't know. I mean, what? I mean, we all kind of know what it is, but kind of, you know, you're the philosophers, you tell me. <laughs> well, I'm not a philosopher, but I, I would say secondary qualities in the, in the 17th century sense, in the Galilean sense, I don't know if you agree with that. I mean, most people won't these days, I don't know. Well, you know, there's an, there's an account that, we can, we, that we're all capable of giving of a subjective um, world. It's reproducible, it's shared between individuals, it supports... <coughs> Like the language that they use to describe what's going on, yeah. um, but, uh, but I mean, I don't, it's really got to get closer to a definition of what it is. Well, what certainly you're talking about when you're talking the word, not obviously unpacking it is. Yeah, but to but then, but then, you know, if I pick up a pick up an object, um, I'm doing it on the basis of a visual information. Yeah. I, I can describe the pathways in my my brain which support that that action the same way that Descartes, Descartes would have done. Um, and it requires, by the way, a good deal of, of knowledge about the nature of the, um, 
the object which is either not represented in your subjective experience or, or differently represented in your visual experience. For instance, um, this process of um, this phenomenon of size constancy, which many of you will, I'm sure, have heard about, but you tend to see the size of <coughs> objects um, as being veridical, being their true sizes, rather than the geometric size determined by their distance. Um, when, you, when you move your hand to look at an object, it's... Well, in some ways, you've got to do the, the perfect extension of that process because what you're doing is shaping your hand to pick up the object as it really is, not according to the image on retina. But, of course, your hand is also reducing in size as it approaches the object. It's quite complex geometrically. Anyway, all of that is going on and could do without you being, in any sense, subjectively aware of what you're doing. And, and you could even say, well, you could say, all right, well, you need, you need the subjectivity to support your assertions and your descriptions of what's going on. Oh, there is a glass, I am going to pick it up. But, but why? I mean, why couldn't you also do all of those things with the actual subjectivity, whatever the subjectivity is? Uh, you, you ended your lecture with that question about um, consciousness. Is it your anticipation that further empirical investigation into the visual processes will find an actual neural correlation of the, as it were, stable visual experience we all have, rather well, than just I'm, a multiplicity yeah, of separate I'm sure that there, there's, going, you know, there's going to be more and more sort of intriguing stuff about changes in neural activity that seems to correlate with changes in subjective awareness, like the, I mean there are now lots and lots of examples, ever more sophisticated, of the experiment on this Rubin vast space solution where you can see events happening in the brain which are tightly correlated with internal changes of judgment about stationary physical stimuli. Um, if you call that an, a neural correlative consciousness, then we're going to have lots of examples of that. But I don't think it gets you any closer to describing what's actually really is going on at the moment that the epiphenomenon subjectivity is, is generated from neural activity. Um, yeah. Do you? I mean, what did? Well, I think it is an epiphenomenon, but I can't answer the previous mm. question. Mm. I think time for right. two, two last questions. One and then two mm. and then, right. then we'll stop. You showed a, a short movie clip. Um, the flicker rate was about seven hertz. It just about threw me. I couldn't look at it. Can pain, nausea, and space out feeling. What's causing that? <laughs> well, do you get it? And you get epilepsy. No. <laughs> You're not those. Yeah. By the way, the flickering was um, partly due to the fact that we tried to introduce um, the equivalent of, um, of tremor, the effect of tremor. I mean, I, I didn't mention this, but the eye, eyeball is also tremoring. Um, unpredictable. You don't, you know, self, self produced eye movements you know about internally because you're producing them. But the eye, there's this muscular tremor that you don't know about centrally, it's also happening. So the image is jiggling around all the time in totally unpredictable ways. You're entirely unaware of, of that. And we were trying to simulate that. So an interesting question, I can't answer your question, but an interesting question is why it's worrying when you see it artificially like that. It's not really happening in your eye. It is not worrying when it's happening in your eye and you're, your brain's unaware of it because it's not producing it. Um, but I can't answer your question about that. Was anybody else freaked out by the... Flicker in the movie? It, it reminds me of when the only way to stop my father showing people his home movies was to say to him, you'll have to stop by feeling seasick. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got time for one last question. Um, yeah, actually, that's not a question I asked for clarification because I, I got a little bit lost. Um, what I understood from the that you said that the input we're getting from vision is not enough to serve as a continuous movie. But then I think a piece is missing, and you just mentioned it when responding to the other person, that uh, we are aware of our uh, conscious eye movements, right? So we, we get this information initially, so we can combine the two sources into a kind of a... Well, that's, of course, what's, what, that is what's traditionally said, that, um, I mean, the fact that the retina has this small area of high resolution has been known for you know, a very long time. So the assumption, and, the, and also the fact that the world appears to be stable even though we're moving our eyes. So as long as we know that we're making the eye movements, we must be internally correcting for them. 
So the assumption is that you're taking these snapshots and remembering the entire snapshot with the high density stuff, the low density stuff, you're jumping to a new position and you're, you're, match, you're, you're superimposing them all together with the correct realignments. So you're gradually filling in the image with these high resolution bits until it all builds up into a total high resolution view. Well, first of all, it doesn't feel like that at all. And secondly, it couldn't be like that because as the experiments show, you forget almost everything that you're looking at, even in the central favela. Almost all of it is lost. But you don't if you keep, I mean, if the change is in the same place, right? It only happens because you either... Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's easily understood in terms of the neurophysiology. Imagine you're a neuron sitting there in V1, and you've got a lovely stimulus on your receptive field, which is making you respond, and suddenly something completely different appears in the same part of the visual field. That's going to be your receptive field. So you're going to stop responding and your neighbours are going to respond because it's their stimulus, not yours. So you've got these sudden switches of activity within a local bit of cortex. It's quite different from having one image in one place and then suddenly it shoots off to a completely different part of your visual cortex so that how a whole group of cells have been doing almost nothing are suddenly hit wham by something for a few hundred milliseconds and they turn off and wait again until by chance it comes back to them, which is, you know, which is the way that it's really, you know, it's really happening. Any questions, sly and answer, but uh, I think we've satisfied John Coffin's <coughs> memorial by having an inspiring lecture, highly accessible, and on one of the most important topics, which at the moment cuts across the disciplines and unites, I think, uh, a lot of people in uh, humanities and in the sciences, the idea that we are very familiar with our subjective experience, but we still to understand how that subjective experience comes about why it has the pattern it has, why it's produced at all, given that we know more and more increasingly about the processes that make it possible. So, Colin, uh, thank you very much, and would you join with me in thanking tonight's lecture?